Dr. Robert Nerschel, chief medical editor of Orthopedics Today, devotes much of his practice to the treatment of shoulder and elbow-related injuries. Dr. Nerschel advocates the use of limited exposure techniques versus arthroscopically assisted techniques for the surgical intervention in many of these injuries. I think the limited resection and repair offers some opportunities, number one, to identify and to palpate the underside of the coracochromial arch so you have a much better opportunity to really to understand whether or not there is stenosis which is occurring in this particular canal, and number two, to identify the uh, rotator cuff pathology better, and number three, if we uh, resect the degenerative changes, we have the opportunity to suture good tendon back to good tendon. So it offers many advantages over arthroscopy in terms of dealing with the rotator cuff itself, and it offers all of the advantages of arthroscopy. The BJO recently met with Dr. Nerschel in Virginia at the Arlington Hospital, where he surgically demonstrates his technique for the repair reconstruction of a torn rotator cuff on a patient displaying several characteristic pathological changes. This particular x-ray uh, reveals uh, some very characteristic uh, changes as far as shoulder, uh, shoulder pathology are concerned. Uh, first off, uh, it uh, depicts uh, some erosion and exostosis of the greater tuberosity. Uh, it also depicts some changes at the AC joint in terms of osteoarthritis with some spurring and so forth in these areas here. This axillary view also depicts some uh, changes which are characteristic of uh, uh, latter stage uh, rotator cuff tendonitis and again you can see some uh, exostosis formation at the greater tuberosity again at the attachment point of the supraspinatus. There are some mild changes that we see in the glenohumeral joint uh, uh, which is not necessarily characteristic of rotator cuff tendonitis, but uh, may be an additional factor in this particular shoulder. The incision is made high at the AC joint level, paralleling the fibers of the deltoid and away from the axillary nerve. Uh, the incision needs to be placed high if you're going to get good exposure. So I think I've observed from time to time some surgeons who have a tendency to make the incision more distally uh, and, and then work their way up, but that really doesn't, uh, doesn't give direct access to the areas that need direct access. All of the operation is going to be occurring up on the top of the apex of the shoulder. Uh, therefore, our, our placement of the incision is high. If we need to uh, deal with the AC joint as time goes on, then we merely expand the incision back toward the supraspinatus fossa. The deltoid is exposed and split fairly longitudinal to protect it. Now that brings us right down onto the subdeltoid bursa. Now this, uh, this gives you a view of the anterior edge of the coracochromial ligament. There's a rotator cuff tear right here and the humeral head is right, right below it there. So there's a fairly good sized rotator cuff tear in this, in this shoulder. Now at this point, uh, we know that there's AC osteoarthritis, and so uh, we're gonna make a decision as to what to do with the AC joint right now. And so the, the best way, in my view, uh, to do that is to put place traction uh, on the arm and then place the finger up underneath the coracochromial arch. Now, what I feel here is uh, that the underside of the acromion anteriorly is perfectly smooth. I feel no hooks, no, no beaks, and no exostosis at all. I do feel an exostosis at the, uh, at the level of the AC joint on the edge of the acromion as well as the distal clavicle. It's been our experience basically that the majority of the patients who have subacromial exostosis really reflect AC osteoarthritis rather than uh, anterior uh, acromial exostosis as such. So that in this situation, we're going to need more exposure. Uh, and one of the best ways to get that then is to take down the AC joint, which removes the uh, 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 exostosis at the same time. So we're going to expand our incision then posteriorly toward the supraspinatus fossa. Exposure is deepened down through the acromioclavicular ligament, exposing the AC joint. It is important to preserve the tissues over the distal clavicle for the acromioclavicular repair. The coracoacromial ligament in this patient is particularly deficient. Now ordinarily what we do in a situation like this is we'll take down some of the ligament, but it's not necessarily to, necessary to take it all down, uh, except if we need some exposure. But in a circumstance like this, I don't have any objection to taking the, the majority of it down, if you will but not necessarily because I think it causes impingement, 
but more because uh, we need exposure to do what we need to do. Now, this gives us a much broader view of the situation in terms of the rotator cuff. And now we can see the cuff. Actually, you see, this is a very nice demonstration that the cuff basically is fissured in, in, in a double layer. So you see part of the rotator cuff is up here, but part of it underneath, so that there's a double layer of fissuring of this, of this, of this rotator cuff. The arm is retracted distally, and the underside of the acromion is examined. We can now get our finger up underneath the edge of the acromion, and there is uh, a small spur, which I feel now right here, but that spur is in relationship to the AC joint, if you will, and is not a spur which is more anterior. Uh, and this is a fairly characteristic situation. So what we'll do is, rather than to do the more, the more traditional acromioplasty, is we'll take an oscillating saw and slide up underneath. Uh, first order business, however, will be to resect some of the distal clavicle. A key elevator is placed for protection, and an oscillating saw is used to resect the distal clavicle, approximately at the metaphyseal flare. And when we look at this specimen, of course, there's no normal articular surface left at all. It's all just totally arthritic. Care is taken to remove any rough edges on the underside of the clavicle. Now you don't want to stray too far medially because, of course, you'll disrupt the conoid and trapezoid ligaments, and then you will get subluxation or dislocation of the distal clavicle. So again, you don't want to be too aggressive. A small spur is also removed from the underside of the acromion. I suppose that's akin to the uh, arthroscopic approach, in a sense. Certainly a little more direct from... Uh, and we can certainly visualize exactly what's happening and we can feel exactly what's happening. There's certain comfort to that. The underside is rasped for smoothness. This also demonstrates a, a, a point that I think is worth making, and that is, as you can see, by traction, you can distally, uh, uh, dislocate the, uh, or sublux the uh, uh, glenohumeral joint. And conversely, of course, the glenohumeral joint will ride up. So that the questions that, are, uh, that I've asked myself is, uh, does the coracochromial arch ride down or does the humerus ride up? And uh, all shoulder surgeons have been able to demonstrate amply the ability for this uh, glenohumeral joint to ride in both directions. So I think the point to be made is that uh, the phenomenon of primary impingement versus the phenomenon of secondary impingement might be raised. Attention is turned to the rotator cuff tear. We see that we have kind of a horizontal uh, alteration of the interior of the tendon. Uh, and at the same time, we have a full thickness tear. And the question is, uh, what's the best way to repair all of this? Now, if we abduct the shoulder, uh, it will bring, uh, it will bring the, the tuberosity into view. And these were the exostoses that we noted uh, on the x-ray right in here. So again, uh, if impingement phenomenon is going to occur, sometimes uh, we may be faced with the problem of the exostosis creating a problem uh, rather than the subacromial space per se. The size of the tear is approximately three by three to four centimeters. Dr. Nerschel examines the biceps tendon. Our experience has been that the majority of the biceps tendons really don't show much change. Uh, uh, and I know that there have been some, some authors who have suggested that the biceps tendon is invariably involved uh, in a lot, of, uh, a lot of abnormality and have even gone so far as to suggest that the biceps tendon be taken out and te tethered down back in the distal bicipital groove. But our experience has been that uh, the majority of the biceps tendons look relatively healthy as this one does and that uh, little or nothing need be done other than just to trim some abnormality about it. Frayed degenerative tissue is excised and sent to pathology. By and large, we always like to have as fresh a tissue as possible when we have a tear this size. Uh, you feel a little reticent to take out too much. Now, we're starting to get a sense of the character of this tear, and it is like most tears, and that is that it is, it is a uh, inverted V, if you will, the apex of the V being back toward the supraspinatus uh, fossa, uh, and we're now coming back to the apex 
of the V, if you will. You can see how, how the pathology of this pervades through the full thickness of the tendon, and that's one of the problems, I think, from an arthroscopic point of view, that it's very difficult to see pathology that, uh, through the full thickness of a tendon, whether or not there's a tear or not. And very often, there's angiofibroblastic change, which pervades the full thickness of the tendon. Our experience in young athletes has been that the majority of them don't have tears. They merely have pathological change in this tissue. Using number one Vicro, Dr. Nerschel sutures the tear, beginning at its apex. The patient's arm is constantly shifted from internal to external rotation and vice versa to maximize exposure. Now what we're confronted with is you see at this point, uh, we're not too bad, uh, but we do have deficiency here. Now this is the tissue that we left, as you recall, uh, left attached down here. And uh, here is the greater tuberosity here. Now you could make a case, I suppose, to take down the tuberosity, the little exostosis, which is here. But in this case, I, d I don't want to do that because I think I need uh, what I've got here uh, for uh, additional repair. And uh, what we're going to do at this point is, I think, just sew this back up over the top. And then we're going to take a patch graft off the uh, off the IT band, and we're going to patch right over the top of it. A graft of sufficient size is retrieved from the iliotibial band and placed shiny side up over the sutured rotator cuff. Okay, let's lay it on. We'll put the shiny side up so that it glides better. And what we'll do is we're just going to lay this patch now right up over the top. And to get that uh, in there, we can let go of this one. The patch is initially anchored and followed with a running stitch completely around its perimeter. Now, here's the, uh, the uh, subscapularis, the medial side of the patch and the rotator cuff, and as we internally rotate the shoulder. Uh, now let's internally rotate, if you will. Here's the patch. Suck there, Bill, a little bit. And here's the infraspinatus side of the patch. And our original anastomosis site of the original injury was right down the middle of the patch. And so this gives us uh, extra stability uh, and uh, has been very helpful in our experience in uh, enhancing rehabilitation and long-term success. You have that, Bill? The arm is placed through a range of motion. Show that we have a fair confidence in our, in our repair. And the graft remains down. secure. In conclusion of this operation, uh, we will uh, repair the uh, uh, acromial clavicular ligament, which is important. Uh, as you can see, basically, uh, when you resect the distal clavicle, uh, the, you get actually extra exposure because the weight of the shoulder actually pulls apart. And so, uh, as you see, when we push in, this all pulls back together. So it's important to repair this tissue for support in here. And then uh, we'll follow the repair with uh, repairing the deltoid down uh, uh, securely. This type of situation then allows for rapid mobilization of the shoulder, since we don't have to concern ourselves with the deltoid uh, in the rehabilitative period. And uh, also, since the, uh, since the relationships of the repair uh, as far as the uh, uh, rotator cuff have been all longitudinal, uh, there's no reason why we can't start forward flexion uh, in a very short time period, a few days after the, after the surgery. The wound is irrigated, a Penrose drain is inserted, and the wound closed. The rehabilitation program should expend approximately three months of patient-dedicated effort to stimulate adequate healing. The best ways to do that are with a rehabilitative uh, resistance system uh, and the resistance systems that we use are all of the things which are available to us, namely calisthenics, uh, water resistance as well as isometrics, uh, uh, isotonics, isoflex, rubberized tension cord resistance and isokinetics. And again, in proper sequence, we'll do all of those uh, resistance systems. Also, you must isolate out those areas of the muscle tendon units which are deficient and which ones are not. And you must also balance the musculotendinous unit in a 360 degree arc around the entire shoulder girdle. Otherwise, you really won't have a balanced system in terms of control of the glenohumeral joint.